Well, it's a few minutes after one o'clock in California, uh, Pacific uh, Daylight Time, and um, I'm John Jordan. I, I, I think it's time for us to begin. And uh, I, I want to welcome all of you to this meeting, the uh, March meeting of the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club, the Fellowship of, uh, uh, of Santa Cruz. And I'm the director of the Dickens Project, which is located at UC Santa Cruz. And I have the very able assistance of Courtney Mahaney, who is the assistant director and who will uh, be helping me to uh, spot people who are raising hands for questions if I don't see anyone. And I also have a few slides to show that Courtney will help me with. And I want to say a, a few words, preliminary words of, of introduction. This is a one-time session on the short essay by Dickens entitled Night Walks that appeared originally in his, his magazine all the year round in 1860. And uh, we circulated a, a copy of this in, and I, I am hoping that many of you uh, read it in that, in that uh, version because it has some notes, it has a very brief introduction by me and it has a map and uh, the, the map I think is, is useful. I'm, I'm going to show the map and, and we'll talk a little bit about um, mapping this essay. Um, but I want also to remind you that the uh, Pickwick Club of Santa Cruz will continue to meet this, uh, 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 this year. And the next text that we will address and be discussing is a tale of two cities. And the leader for those meetings will be Wayne Batten. Wayne, uh, I assume, is here someplace. It's a large screen, so I'm, I'm not seeing everyone at this moment. But uh, Wayne, are, are, you, are you here? Could you say hello just so your screen will flash up on the... Um, are, are you here, Wayne? 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 It doesn't look like join he's us here. Join us later. He's not here. Yeah. It is. He is here. Courtney, is that what you said? Not yet. Not yet. OK. But uh, Two Cities will, will be the next text that the Pickwick Club of Santa Cruz will be discussing. And there will be three sessions devoted to that in April, May, and, and then in July and August, there will be no meeting and we'll resume again in fall. Uh, be by Dickens or a text by Dickens uh, that we will read. And I chose Night Walks as a, as a text for us to discuss in, in, uh, in, in this book club for a couple of reasons. Um, one is I think it's a, a, a stunning piece of, of writing just in its own right. And um, it, it doesn't get discussed as much in, in, in meetings of, about Dickens, although Anyone who is a serious Dickensian, of course, knows it. It was, as I, as I said, it was published initially in 1860 in the magazine all the year round. And then it was collected in uh, Dickens's volume called The Uncommercial Traveler. And that is a, is a collection of, of essays uh, by Dickens. And when it was originally published, it, it, when it was published in, in the, the Uncommercial Traveler, it was, it was published under the title Night Walks. And that's the way in which it is best known. But when it was originally published in, uh, in All the Year Round in the magazine, it was the, the title was simply The Uncommercial Traveler. And that's, that's because there was a series uh, of, uh, of uh, short pieces that Dickens wrote and published in the magazine all the year and they, they all had titles. So what, what is an uncommercial traveler? Um, the, uh, the title 
may be familiar, may be recognizable to, to many people, particularly uh, if, if you know a little bit about uh, uh, Victorian culture, British culture more generally, a commercial traveler is a sales representative, a sales rep, I think we, we would uh, call it uh, in American English. That is uh, someone who represents a company or perhaps only himself and who travels around a, a region or, or a larger area uh, promoting something that he's selling. So you, you might also think of a, a commercial traveler as a traveling salesman. And uh, Dickens was connected with an organization of commercial travelers. And um, he took a, <laughs> came up with the idea of calling himself an uncommercial traveler. Th that is someone who is also a traveler uh, who travels around from place to place, but who's not selling anything. He's an uncommercial traveler. Uh, but th there's a little bit of a joke there, I think that we can, uh, we can discern, which is that Dickens is also in his own way, a commercial traveler, because he's also selling something. He's selling copies of all the year round. And uh, so Dickens is an uncommercial traveler. He's, he's not selling a, a product. He's not selling, um, you know, uh, uh, candy bars. The, the, when, when I was a boy, uh, the man who lived next door was a sales representative for a candy company. And I thought he was the most wonderful man in the world because he would always give me sample candy bars when he came back from uh, a trip. So he was a commercial traveler and I was a beneficiary of his commerce. Um, Dickens uh, traveled, as we know, and he wrote travel essays. He wrote travel books. Uh, he wrote a book about his travels to America, about his travels to uh, Italy. He also wrote these occasional pieces like the one night walks. They're about different kinds of travels. Was mentioning um, earlier before we began, uh, this is a genre. It's a particular kind of of writing, of which there are other eggs, of which Dickens's writings are uh, an outstanding example. Um, and the genre is, is, I guess we could call it night walks. I mean, uh, particularly walks around London. And Dickens had actually started his career as a writer by writing uh, small sketches. As you probably know, the, the first publication before Pickwick Papers that, that Dickens uh, did was Sketches by Boz. And Sketches by Boz consisted of short essays, um, observation pieces, uh, um, a few stories. It was a, a miscellaneous collection of, uh, of of writing, um, and among the, I guess you could say most of the, the pieces in Sketches by Boz are sketches, that is, they're, they're brief pieces of observation. And Dickens was writing and publishing under the pseudonym of Boz, and uh, later, uh, of course, he, he assumed uh, his own name and published under that under that name. But the, the persona, the 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 the, um, the identity that he used for these occasional pieces that were published in newspapers and that were published in in other serial periodicals uh, during the early 1830s, between 1833 and 1836, were published under the the pseudonym of Boz, and then they were subsequently collected in the volume called Sketches by Boz. And among them, the, eventually when, when, uh, when Sketches by Boz was, uh, was published as a single volume or as a volume, uh, uh, it, it was divided into different groups.
and, and these, this was not the chronological order were published. Uh, it, it, it's a sort of a topical grouping, it was called Our Parish. And the, uh, the second section was called Scenes, and the third section was called Characters, and the fourth section was called Tales. And the tales were narratives. They were, they were short stories, as, as we would describe them today. But the earlier pieces, the, the um, Our Parish uh, sketches and the scenes and, and characters are not really narratives. They're, they're more just, um, you know, descriptions. They're, they're descriptions of things that Boz, the, the, the name that he's assumed as the narrator of these, um, these sketches, uh, observes in uh, sketches by Boz is the, early version of essays like Night Walks, the one that we're reading. And in the section called um, Scenes, the very first scene is called The Streets Dash Morning. And the second scene is called The Streets Dash Night, at night. And so, uh, as early as the 1830s, Dickens was writing in this genre of night walks around the city of London. And one way to think about night walks, the, the piece from 1860, is as a revisiting of sketches by Boz, and in particular of the sketch called The Streets at Night. And I, I, I think it, it's useful when we when we read Night Walks to compare it not only with other pieces in this genre by other writers and and someone I for, for I didn't quite catch who it was at the uh, before we began today was talking about the piece by George Augustus Sala called Twice Round the Clock and Sala was one of Dickens's young men he he wrote for all the year round. He was a friend of, of Dickens and, and someone who wrote in, in many ways in imitation of, of Dickens. Um, although Dickens was of course the inimitable. Um, uh, he wrote in this genre and he was himself writing in a tradition of other travel writers. And I, and I think when we, we think of, of Night Walks that it, it's useful to, to compare it with that early piece from the 1830s called The Streets at Night, and also to think of it in relation to what some other writers, travel writers, ha had written and had said. And I think one, th there's, a, there's a quotation, a famous quotation, that I think is, I, 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 can't, I can't swear that Dickens was familiar with this quotation, but it's so well known that I, I feel pretty confident that Dickens was familiar with this. And it comes from Samuel Johnson. And it's quoted in Boswell's famous Life of, of Johnson. And Samuel Johnson said, it's, an, it's sort of a, uh, an epigrammatic statement. When a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. For there is in London all that life can afford. And I think, Dickens is familiar with that. He's writing in the tradition of, of people who think about uh, London and write about London and appreciate London and see London, of, if not of the entire world, at least of, uh, of, uh, of urban, uh, urban life. So, and then there's another quote that I know Dickens was familiar with, and I, I, I want to read this one. And I know he was familiar with it because he, he uses it in Sketches by Boz, um, and not in the, the piece about the streets at night, but in the, the very next sketch that follows the streets at night, which is called uh, The Shops, I think, I think it is. Um, and uh, here's, it's a quotation from the novelist, the 18th century novelist. We know that Dickens was very fond of 18th century uh, fiction. 
And it's a quotation from the novelist Lawrence Stern. And here's what uh, Stern said. And it's a, it's a quotation that's very similar to what uh, Samuel Johnson said about a man who's tired of London is tired of life, and, but it has a slightly different emphasis. So here, here's what Stern said. I pity the man who can travel from Den to Beersheba and say, tis all barren. And so it is, and so is all the world to him who will not cultivate the fruits it offers. So Stern is saying something, something similar to Johnson. He's saying it in a slightly different way. He says he feels sorry for, I pity the man who can travel from Dan to Beersheba and say, tis all barren. Um, and uh, that's a person who travels but learns nothing from his travels, who observes nothing and who remains content in his own world, his own preconceptions. And in the little essay from Sketches by Boz, uh, Dickens begins, and I wanted to, to read this uh, by quoting Stern. So it's chapter three of, of Sketches by Boz. And he says, what inexhaustible food for speculation do the streets of London afford? We never were able to agree with Stern in pitying the man who could travel from Dan to Beersheba and say that all was barren. We have not the slightest commiseration for the man who can take up his hat and stick and walk from Covenant Garden to St. Paul's Churchyard and back into the bargain without deriving some amusement. We had almost said instruction from his perambulation. So Dickens says, I don't, I don't, you know, Stern feels sorry for that person who travels and doesn't learn anything from it. Um, uh, I, I disagree with Stern because uh, I, I agree with his sentiment, but I, I disagree with him <laughs> about feeling sorry for someone like that. That's, that's a person who's just ignorant and doesn't learn anything from the process of travel. So we all know the cliche that travel is broadening and that we travel to learn about other places and other cultures. And I think that, you know, night walks is, is a wonderful example of, of that. And at the very beginning of night walks, um, uh, in the second paragraph, uh, the narrator says, in the course of those nights, I finished my education in a fair amateur experience of houselessness. So education is, uh, is part of the goal of, uh, of walking through the streets of, of London. Um, so again, this is, this is just by way of uh, uh, trying to situate night walks in a larger literary and cultural tradition that precedes Dickens and follows Dickens. And the genre of night walks is, a, if you will, a subset, a specialized urban subset of travel writing more generally. So I see a hand up and I'll, I'll, I'll yes, Mike, would you like to, to say something? Mike, you should unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, um, I would situate this it, in a somewhat different context, kind of at the intersection of three different traditions, um, which Dickens in some ways is, is one of the co-originators of. One is the flaneurs of Paris, you know, being a flaneur, a walker of the streets in 19th century Paris. It's, a, it's, it's a something, you know, from Balzac and his cohorts um, all the way up through the 20th century. Uh, <clears throat> And the second is film noir, and the third is journalism. <laughs> um, you know, um, Raymond Chandler famously put it, down these mean streets must go a man who is not mean. And, you know, the detective vanishing into the midnight city to find the secret mystery at the heart of the urban uh, confusion, mess, and corruption. And then, and finally, you know, newspaper movies. Um, Dickens is a great newspaper man. And, you know, the, the, the reporter, again, vanishing into the midnight city to uncover the story. Um, 
the, the iconic modern version of that, there's an incredible tracking shot in all the president's men. Uh, where um, there are two. The first one is when they're in the Library of Congress and Woodward and Bernstein are looking for the library slips and the crane goes up to the top of the roof of the Library of Congress. But the second one, the one that's about night walks, is they're driving out of the parking lot of the Post in, 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 uh, in uh, Woodward's Volvo, and you can, which has distinctive taillights. And you, the camera pulls back and pulls up and you see the car vanishing into the dark midnight streets of Washington. Uh, and that it follows the taillights from higher and higher and higher as the car vanishes into the maelstrom of Washington. And again, I think th those are kind of the three genres where I sit. Not it's not travel writing to me. It's much more gritty and urban than that. Um, I thank you for those those excellent comments, and, and and I think all of them are spot on. They're they're accurate and. Um, I, I, would, I would make one small distinction, uh, which is that you mentioned the flaneur tradition. And the, the term flaneur, it's a, it's a French term, and it was uh, used in the, the origin of the, uh, of the word and the origin of the genre are, are French. Um, and I think that the term flaneur applies very accurately the sketches by Boz, because the persona of Boz is someone who wanders. A flaneur is someone flannery is is wandering. Uh, it's it's non narrative. It's non teleological. It has no direction. Um, uh, it, it's it's aimless in the literal sense that it does not have an aim, a goal, it's, it's not purposeful. And so I think that Night Walks, uh, again, comparing it with the early sketches by Boz, uh, is not exactly flaneur, it's not exactly flanerie. There, there's something else that's going on. And we might, we might think of, I mean, another, another way to try and locate night walks is I, I called it semi-autobiographical. Um, and I think one way we can read night walks is as a story about Dickens. It, it's, it, it's really a, a very personal essay and there are personal comments in it or personal uh, reflections that I think we can relate back to what we know about Dickens, the man. But I think Night Walks, even more than Sketches by Boz, needs to be read as fiction, needs to be read as a short story, needs to be read as something with a beginning and a middle and an end. It's not, uh, it's not random, casual observations that are not put together uh, coherently. And so in that sense, I think it's, it's not quite in the flaneur tradition. It, it's, it, it, it's doing something not just different, but something in addition to, to the flaneur tradition. And then your other comments of, about film noir and journalism. I mean, of course, Dickens was a journalist. He began as a journalist. Uh, the all the year round publications. This this is a piece of documentary journalism. You you could say this is on the on the spot journalism. It's it's reporting from the streets of London, um, and uh, he's selling London to uh, his audience. He's a commercial traveler in in that sense. So, uh, but thank you for the observations. And I see another hand. David, go ahead. Unmute too. Okay, got it. I just wanted to mention, particularly with the sketches by Boz, that Dickens clearly has in mind Washington Irving sketches, which were originally published in England before they were in the United States. But everybody knew those and uh, that was a good model for a young writer. Yes, 
So the, the sketch is another genre to keep in mind. What, what is a sketch? I mean, a sketch is a, um, is a term that comes from the visual arts uh, and it's been appropriated into uh, to the world of, of fiction or journalism or um, narrative prose uh, uh, writing. And um, a sketch is a quick take. Uh, it's, it's not a finished, it's a preparatory. You could say the sketch is sometimes preparatory to a longer, more sustained piece of painting. Um, a sketch is what the artist does as a, as a first take. Artists take sketchbooks with them when they, they have an idea. And so the sketch is, is a preliminary piece. Um, and, and it's in, in that sense, almost ephemeral, uh, uh, or at least it's a less serious or their expectations for a sketch are quite, are not as high as they would be for uh, a painting uh, or for a novel. Um, and uh, uh, so that provisional sense of, of sketch is, I think, part of this. But again, I think night walks, again, think of the date of, of night walks. It's 1860, published in 1860. How many novels has Dickens written by then? What else is he writing at the time? He's about, uh, he's about to start Great Expectations. So this is, this is a very mature writer. This is, this is an accomplished, skilled, professional writer, not just an experienced journalist, but an experienced writer of prose fiction. And uh, again, it's, it, it's why I think Night Walks deserves to be put among the examples of Dickens's prose at its at the top of his, of his game. I mean, he, he's, he's really masterful. And uh, if you compare this with the early sketches and just compare the texture of the language of what he's doing, you'll see how much more complicated this is than, um, than, than the early sketches by Boz. So I want I to move now, uh, Courtney, if you could put up the, the PowerPoint for me and just quickly go through some basic facts about, uh, uh, about night walks. And I'm gonna show you some things and then end up with the map because I, I, I wanna talk about the map that was included in the edition that we circulated. Uh, uh, so uh, here is the screen sharing. That, It was there in a way, but I'm not seeing the PowerPoint. Here we go. Courtney is, is. So thank you. So this is the, um, the title page of a collected a volume of All the Year Round. Um, and you'll see that it's conducted by Charles Dickens, with which is incorporated Household Words, the earlier magazine that Dickens uh, edited. And the, uh, uh, the essay, the story, Night Walks, is collected in volume three of the collected edition. You see the little epigraph up at the top, the story of our lives from year to year, from Shakespeare that uh, Dickens uh, took as the device, as the sort of thematic. It's a weekly journal. This is journalism. It comes out every week. Um, and at the bottom is the address of the um, House of All the Year Round, the publication site, London, number 26, Wellington Street, and the date 1860. So the next slide, please, uh, Courtney. And we'll go, this, this is the table of contents for that particular volume. It's a list of everything that alphabetical list by title of everything that appears. Um, and then the next page, please, Courtney, um, continues the table of contents 
no, excuse me. This is the uh, this is the table of contents for magazine number sixty five, Saturday, April the fourteenth, eighteen sixty. So this tells you what was uh, in that particular uh, magazine. So the there were seven items. They were actually just six items, and the first was installment thirty five of. Uh, the novel The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, a very well-known example of sensation fiction that was published initially in All the Year Round. Uh, the second was uh, an essay on shipwrecks. Uh, and, and we, to this day, do not know who the author of that essay was, although there is the possibility that we may know very soon uh, because of research that is in progress. Um, Dickens was himself very interested in shipwrecks and shipwrecks appear in uh, some of his fiction, uh, most famously near the end of David Copperfield. Um, the third essay in that volume was called Opening a Barrow, author unknown. And a barrow is a, um, I'm going to use another fancy word for it, a tumulus. It's a burial place. And uh, this essay describes, uh, it, it's a first person essay. It's, it's a, a little bit of a travel essay, you could say, in which the narrator uh, uh, goes with an archaeologist, uh, 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 a, a scholar, and opens a burial place of ancient Britons. And they discover bones, and they discover uh, skulls, and it's written in a kind of comic, uh, macabre tone. And um, I, I, I would suggest that, and it ends with the, the narrator taking a piece of skull <laughs> that was discovered when they opened the barrow uh, with him on the train back to, um, to, to London. And uh, it, there, there's a reference to Yorick and to Hamlet in, in the essay. And of course, also a reference to Yorick uh, in uh, the um, Night Walks piece as well. Then the fourth piece by Dickens, we know, uh, although there, there are no, uh, uh, no, no names of authors are indicated in all the around. But we know, of course, that the uncommercial traveler is Charles Dickens. And of course, that's the persona that he adopts. And I've, I've already explained what an uncommercial traveler is. And then the fifth piece, Our Eyewitness Sitting at a Play. And it's by Charles Alston Collins, who was the brother of Wilkie Collins. His name gets cut off a little bit there at the end. Um, and uh, it's a, a, a comic piece. There's usually a, 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 a certain amount of comedy in each issue of All the Year Round. And it's a description by Charles Collins, uh, who, who published a, a series of these. It's like the Uncommercial Traveler that appeared in several uh, different issues of the magazine. Our eyewitness is Charles Collins. And so he publishes, he, he's a, an eyewitness of various current events. And he goes to a provincial production of a play and it's a melodrama and it's, uh, it's hilariously funny because the, the melodrama is uh, one of these exaggerated 18th century of, of theater in which there's, uh, there's a conspicuous villain and a conspicuous and uh, uh, a heroine who's in danger. And it's written in, in a kind of tongue in cheek um, style uh, that makes fun of the plot same time is thoroughly in theater culture. And we know that Dickens himself was a great fan of the theater and that he was, uh, uh, he enjoyed melodrama in, in various forms. So, so what, the point I'm trying to make is, is that uh, it's useful to think of the context in which a particular essay appears in 
in order to understand what else is going on in the world of Dickens's journalism. And then the last piece, and this supports Mike's statement ab about uh, the link between film noir and detective fiction and something like uh, um, Nightwalks, is entitled Viduc, French Detective in Two Portions. And this is number two. Um, and it is also by Wilkie Collins. And so this is a, uh, it's a two piece article by Wilkie Collins that discusses the life and career of Viduc, who is the famous French detective and uh, the one of the very first literary detectives, um, um, that is someone who was famous in real life, but who also was so famous that he entered into fiction. And we know, of course, that Dickens himself was very interested in the detective police, that he traveled at night through the streets of London uh, with Inspector Field, one of his essays, earlier essays is called On Duty with Inspector Field. And um, Wilkie Collins also is very interested in detectives and detective fiction can be traced back to 19th century novels. And Dickens is one of the important influences. We can't really say that Bleak House is the very first detective novel. Um, um, people debate what that is, and some people say, oh, Sophocles wrote the first detective story uh, in Oedipus Tyrannus, Oedipus Rex. Um, but detective fiction uh, with, uh, with formal detectives uh, dates from the 19th century, and Collins and Dickens are both part of that. So, so anyway, Way. Just that, this is to give you a sense of, of uh, what else is in that particular issue of All the Year Round. So next slide, please, Courtney. And this is the first page of, uh, in which the essay uh, appears, uh, Night Walks. Yes. No, this, this is the first page of, excuse me, this is the first page of All the Year Round as you would have purchased it. Um, and it, you see the date, it's number 65, Saturday, July uh, 21, 1960. It actually came out on the 20th. Uh, and there's the woman in white. And then the next page gives you uh, the end of uh, page 348, the end of the installment for. Uh, yep, next slide, please, Courtney. Yes, so you see the end of the installment for the woman in white and the beginning of the uncommercial traveler essay, uh, which then continues on 350, it started on 340, 349, and concludes on page 352. And um, then you see the beginning of the next essay in, uh, uh, yeah, next slide, please, Courtney. The next slide, please. This is the beginning of, of, of the, the next essay, our eyewitness sitting at a play. I'm, yes, that's, so this is the next essay, our eyewitness sitting at a play. And then you get the description of this uh, exaggerated melodrama uh, that follows by Charles Collins. And then the next slide, please, Courtney. And I'm showing you this just so that you, get a sense of the format, the layout, the two column per page uh, format that uh, uh, all the year round adopts. This is the last slide. Yes. No, you, you, do you have the map? Oh. Here we go. Okay, so this is where I'm, I'm really headed is, is to the map, I hope. I hope you have the map, Courtney. Yes, okay.
and I, I hope other people, um, th th this map is, is taken from the, the, a web page. Uh, it's David Perdue's Dickens page or Dickens website. And uh, it contains a very useful um, map that is keyed to night walks. So uh, we attribute it, you'll see up at the top, Night Walks, a map by David Perdue. And it names the, the main places that are mentioned in the essay. So you see that the, the, the circuit, uh, uh, the journey that is taken is roughly a circular journey. Um, that is, it, it well, I, I, I want to ask a question about uh, where it begins and where it ends, but uh, it, it traces roughly a circle. It goes from Waterloo Bridge to prison, to the Bank of England, to Billingsgate, the uh, fish market. It crosses London Bridge. It passes by King's Bench Prison. It passes by Bethlehem Hospital, Bedlam as it's called. It crosses Westminster Bridge. It goes near the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey, comes back by St. Martin's Church, and ends near Covent Garden and the coffee shops of Bow Street. So I have a, a question ab about this map, which I think is a very useful map. It's a, it's a good map, and it, it helps to orient us in thinking about the, the places that are are named in this um, in in this essay, but I have I have a question. This this is a, a question for everyone. What places in the story are mentioned but not named that should be on this map? What are the places that are mentioned in the essay but are not marked on this map? And then I, I have a second question about, about the map. Jean. Please unmute. Would it be Haymarket as one of them? is mentioned as a place that he does not visit. So yes, I mean, there, there are references to places that he doesn't go, but it's, it, that, that too is important. Any other places that are mentioned, but not that don't appear on this map. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one that's important. Uh, it's the theater. It's yeah, the, the theaters. theaters. Yeah, the theaters. The, the, the theaters are, are are mentioned. They're not mentioned by name. There are two great theaters that are only uh, a few hundred steps from Waterloo Bridge, and I I put a footnote into our edition of that. And the the two are the Adelphi, which is located on the Strand, just uh, a, a little bit to the west of Waterloo Bridge. It's, it's really very close. It's, it's less than five minutes to, to the Adelphi Theater. And then the other theater, which is a little bit farther away, is uh, the, the Covent Garden Theater, which is the Royal Opera House. And um, so those are important places. And they appear early in the essay. Uh, before he goes to Newgate Prison and after he has been to Waterloo Bridge. But there's some other places that are mentioned in the essay, but not named. So, Mike. Lincoln's Inn, the courts. Lincoln's Inn is not mentioned. It's mentioned, but it is not located on the, um, on the map. Another uh, place that is mentioned and not uh, located located on the map is the train station. It ends the essay, or that's very close to the end, is, is the train station. And we don't know which train station he's talking about. Um, and uh, it could be any, any one of several uh, Victorian train stations, but 
Um, and he doesn't actually talk about walking to the train station. It, th there's, if, there's, there's always a continuity. If, you, if you'd follow this itinerary, um, there's always a, a mention of going from one place to the next. But when he goes to the train station, it's a jump. It's, it's, he doesn't, the essay doesn't tell you that he walks from Bow Street to the train station. Um, it, 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 it takes place in a, on a different walk. Um, so yes, uh, Kendall. How, how about the cemetery? The cemetery? Um, cemetery is mentioned, but uh, not mentioned, uh, but mentioned, but not mentioned. located. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and there, there, there's, yes, I, I'll take a couple more. Liam, what else is mentioned? But not well, just, no, I was just going to say the implication is that he isn't speaking about any one particular station. He's talking about various nights on which, on nights that there wasn't a market, or then I might visit a railway terminus. Yes. So, so, so several different stations he's talking about. It's yes, not and just, that, not just one. That, that, that's an important uh, thing to, to emphasize that. Uh, this itinerary is a continuous walk, and it's not one continuous walk. You can read it that way, but it's many. And uh, this raises raises a question for me. This is this is a a recurring experience. It's not just one experience. This this is a description that has many different temporal locations. And for me, it has the, the structure of a, not just a rep repeated experience, but a, a recurring dream. And that's one of the metaphors, I think, the organizing metaphors, <clears throat> that uh, the night walk is like a nightmare. And it's something that is a repeated experience. Now, um, there's one, one other important uh, place that is mentioned, but not pointed out on the map. And it's home. The walk ends, the walk begins, and it ends with home, the bed in which he is sleeping or unable to sleep, and to which he begins in bed and ends up going back home. So where does, and I think, you know, with all due respect for this map, the map is misleading as to the, does the walk begin? Where is home? Mentioned, but not marked on the map. Where is home? Do we know where home is? Can we speculate? Is, is home more than one place? Is this a, a, a recurring walk that takes place from different starting places? I, ha I have an idea. I have, I'll, 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 I'll tell you my idea about uh, where I think home is. I think home is not at the foot of Waterloo Bridge on the south side of, the, you know, that, that's not home. That Waterloo Bridge is one of the early places that is mentioned. It's the first landmark that, it, that is mentioned. But I think home is an address that we have already seen. Home is the editorial offices of all the year round. It's 26 Wellington Street. All the year round is the place where this essay begins. Where is Wellington Street? If you look very carefully at the map, you can see that the street that leads directly into Water Ridge is Wellington Street. And the headquarters of all the year round where Dickens kept private rooms when he was in London, he stayed in those rooms. That is, I, I think, at least one possibility for where this essay begins. It begins <laughs> where he's writing it <laughs> or where he's publishing it. Um, it begins, if, if you see, it's just a little bit north of, of, of the Strand. 
it's and the the building is still you can you can if you go to 20 if you do a google search on 26 Ellington street london um you can actually find the historical marker that is on the building at that place that locates this as the as the editorial offices of all year round so i i think that locates this essay as a piece of writing it's both about a physical journey through space, but it's also a literary journey that has its origins in the place of publication of the journal in which it begins and where Dickens kept rooms in which he had a bed and in which he, <laughs> he slept or didn't sleep. So anyway, that's my proposal to you ab about where home is, that, that home is all the year round. So um, my next question to you, and, and, and I'm trying to now to, to move um, into thinking of this as a short story rather than an autobiographical piece, though we always have to think of both of those. We need to think of this as an autobiographical piece about Dickens, but also as a piece of fiction, as, as an imaginative construction. So what are the places mentioned in the essay that could not be located on this map? The train station is one because this map doesn't go up to the Northern train stations if, if that's one of the, but, but I'm not talking, what, what are the, uh, places mentioned that could possibly be represented on this map because they're not in England. One of the places that he goes to is um, the theater. And I think it's the, um, the Covent Garden Royal uh, uh, Opera House where he once saw a performance of, um, uh, how does he describe it? Of, uh, uh, da, 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 um, the peasantry of Naples dancing among the vines. Um, and, uh, ground at my feet where when last there I had seen the peasantry of Naples dancing among the vines, reckless of the burning mountain to overwhelm them. Um, that's in Sicily. <laughs> you can't re represent Sicily on this map, but it's a place that he has visited imaginatively in his night walks. So there are places that are visited, places that are mentioned that do not exist in England and that exist only in the imagination, in the mind of the narrator. So when we talk about night walks and when we think about night walks as a kind of imaginative journey through space, we need to think of it as an imaginative journey through time as well. And I, one of the things that I would propose uh, about night walks is that it is, an example of time travel. Now time travel, the most prominent example of time travel in Dickens is a Christmas carol in which the spirit of Christmas past and Christmas future yet to come um, takes Scrooge to visit places from his past and from his future. I think that Night Walks is similarly an experience of time travel. But how, how would that work? How, how is this an experience of time travel? Does, does that make sense to, to anyone? I mean, you know, if you can go to Sicily and see Mount Vesuvius, uh, Mount Etna, excuse me, uh, erupting, um, you, you can go anywhere. And you can go at any time. The, the play, on which this is based, the uh, Massianello, 
which was, uh, is based, it's an opera by the French composer Aubert, uh, is set in Italy, in Sicily, in um, uh, the uh, 17th century. But when you go to see a play that's set in the 17th century, you're traveling in time to the 17th century. How else can night walks be considered time travel? Anybody have any thoughts about that? There is this scene uh, with a murder that he kind of, uh, it, 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 it happened in reality, but in his story it didn't happen yet. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding. What, say again, please. I, I say there are uh, 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 one scene uh, where he describes a person that is about to be murdered, but he describes him as not being murdered yet, and he's probably sleeping in his bed uh, peacefully. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, that's a good example of the distortions of time that exist. When does this essay take place? What is the, temp what is the time of this essay? When is it written, and when when does when do the events of the of the walk take place? And one of the things that happens when he is the bridge when he crosses London Bridge is that he talks about the discovery of a body of a corpse that was thrown over the edge of the bridge. But at the time of the walk, that person was still sleeping peacefully in his bed. Uh, and that corpse was discovered in 1857. Uh, but the walk is taking place prior to 1857. But it's published in, in 1860. So wh when is, if we are to date the walk or the walks, because it's plural, you remember it's not just a single walk, it's many different walks at different times of Dickens's life. Um, what's the date of this? How is, how it's, it's, a, it's a story about time travel. <coughs> but how else, how else can we think about the, the way in which time is represented? In one sense is clock time. You could also say it's railroad time. One of the things that the railroads did when they uh, were introduced into, into London was that there became a, a standard time. Railroad time was the way that, that people measured, you know, you could count on trains to leave at a certain time and to arrive at a certain time. And Dickens goes to a train station and meets some mail train that is coming in. Um, and the train unloads very rapidly. And um, uh, in, in fact, one of the things that he points out is, is that, uh, Everything happens so fast when that train unloads that it all takes place in a flash. So time is not measured according to a regular sequence. So this, this is literary time too. This is I mean, literary it's, time. It's literary. This has the, the palimpsest structure of David Copperfield. It, 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 where yes. David, is always, David is always moving back and forth. Yes, and yes. memory, yes. present day memory, different memories, dreams. Exactly. They're, they're, all, they're all melded together. It, you know, it's a very Joycean mix, actually. Exactly. Um, it's, <clears throat> this, this is modernity. This, this, is, uh, you know, this is a very modern essay. It's modern in the way that it deals with and represents time. So let's talk about the different time that are involved. What, what if we think about this as Dickens visiting his own autobiographical and personal past? Dickens going back to childhood. Does that help to, to think about this essay? Or what places that he mentions evoke his childhood? Well, and the prison, you know, debtor's yeah. prison. Yeah. And, but, I mean, this is, Hunger, you, know, you know, Hungerford Stairs is not mentioned either. You know, Hunger, like, well, yes, you, you, you can know, also. Factory, you know, where the blocking factory was. I mean, you know, in some ways, this is um, the autobiographical fragment 
in, exactly. in, in space rather than in exactly in time. exactly so. yes i mean the king's bench prison is not the martial sea the martial sea is avoided uh but it's conspicuous in its absence but the king's branch prison is another debtor's prison so when he goes by the, the king's bench prison um he's remembering his father he's remembering his father's imprisonment for debt um and this this walk or this series of walks or this imaginative walk is a walk back through dickens's own past it's uh, when he goes to the past the law courts, he's remembering his experience as a law clerk. Um, when when he goes past the houses of parliament, he's remembering his time as a parliamentary reporter. Um, when uh, when he, he goes to Covent Garden, when he goes to the theater, he's remembering every one of his experiences. I mean, he he specifically references having been to see the play Marchionella. Uh, um, you know, this, this it's about memory. This is a journey about memory. It's a memory. It's 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 a, it's a journey through time and space and through a personal history, and through I think a larger history. Um, he's passing by and describing many of the institutions that date back through the history of England. This is, in a way, a journey back through the national past, the historical past, not just the personal past, but through the prison, past the bank, uh, past the market, past the prison, past the madhouse, uh, past the houses of parliament, uh, through the, past the church, past St. Martin's church, past the theaters, uh, um, th this, this is a journey through time and space. It's time travel and it's space travel, but it's literary space travel. It's, it's, it's another version of Scrooge and the, and the spirits, except that Dickens is both the, the guide and the person who is guided. He's the guide and Who's the person being guided? We are the person who's being guided. We, we are the, if you will, the Scrooge figure. We are the, the person who's being taken on the tour of the heart of London past the major institutions. Institutions that also for Dickens raise questions about the structure of, of, of English society, um, raising questions about social class, about wealth, about inequity of wealth, about debt, and, and the, the legal system of imprisonment for debt. Um, and when he gets uh, about the church and what is the role of the church? Is, the, is this a, uh, an investigation of, of religion? How religious is this? How, how Christian is, the, is this essay? Um, does it have any references to religion? What are the references to religion? They, they, they meant it was almost like a ghost that suddenly disappeared and left him with a garment. Yes, yes. Well, it certainly is a ghost story. I mean, this, yeah. this, 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 um, this whole thing is a, is a, is a nightmare uh, in which the tour guide is a ghost and we are asked to accompany him on a ride so we're ghosts as well and he, he keeps encountering ghosts uh, along the way so um uh, it's it's a it's a marvelously complex story but how is it a christian story how is it a religious story or a story about religion directly indirectly through allusion through reference The, by the way, just to, an aside while you ponder that question, the, the play that he mentions having seen at the Royal Opera Theater, Mastianello, is a story about revolution. Um, it's a political play. And it was used for political purposes when it was, when it was published. And in France, it was, it was closely connected to the 1830 July Revolution. 
Um, it was originally produced in the 18, late 1820s. And so uh, it, 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 there's a story about social conflict that lies in this, in this essay. How is it religious? Where is there religion in, in the story? Yes, um, Phyllis and then Ricardo. Um, hi, well, uh, uh, I referenced very near the end um, to the real desert region of the night, which to me is part of the whole Jesus going into the desert, that kind of thing. Um, I, it's been a while since I've read much religious stuff, but that's um, one feeling. <laughs> um, okay. But, but back to your idea that this is a modern, um, uh, story, short story, or Please. modern writing. Um, the final closing, um, uh, I knew well enough where to find vice and misfortune of all kinds if I had chosen. So that's implying he's choosing not to. But they were put out of sight and my houselessness, which houseless became a character and now it's back <laughs> to being a characteristic had many miles upon miles of streets in which it could and it did have its own solitary way. That sort of has an existential ring to it to me. <laughs> 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 to bring in another um, anachronistic uh, phrase, but it really does have that. It's, it's not Victorian sounding to me. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that's a very good observation. And I, I, I would say that one of the main themes, if we were to talk about this as a short story and uh, investigate its themes and its, its principal terminology, the, the, the words that stand out, houselessness, of course, is, is, is central to, to, to this essay. And houselessness is a, both a condition, a social condition, of being, as we say today, homeless. And the narrator of this short story is able both to describe it and then to inhabit that identity in an amateur way, as he says. So it's um, amateur here means not permanent, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's an identity that he can assume and experience and identify with and sympathize with, but he has a home he can go back to. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, a, an existential condition because for some people, houselessness is not an identity that can be put on and taken off. It, it's a permanent condition. And that's, that's a, a, a very important part of the, the social, dimension of, of this essay. This, this is investigative journalism at its best by someone who goes out and visits places that most people, most readers of a, you know, the, the, the audience for all the year round is middle-class audience. They don't go out at night and walk around the streets of London and encounter strange homeless people, but this narrator, is willing to do that for us. So, so that's, that's an important dimension of, but um, there are many other ways in which this, this essay I think is modern. And uh, I'll, I'll just do a little riff on that. Um, the, the, the Marxist literary and social cultural critic, um, Walter Benjamin uh, writes about modernity. And he talks, he has a, a, an essay, a, long, a lengthy essay uh, called Paris, the Capital of the 19th Century. And I think we could make an argument that London is the capital of the 19th century for Dickens. And um, one of the things, one of the ways in, in, in which this essay is modern and Dickens is a modern writer is the city is modern. The experience of the city is one of the quintessential experiences of the modern world. And when Benjamin writes about uh, 
Paris as the capital of the city. And Benjamin is one of the people who's talking about the flaneur as a, uh, you don't have flaneurs in the countryside. You have, the flaneur figure is, is a figure that exists only within an urban context. So the flaneur is a quintessentially modern figure. And one of the experiences of modernity that um, Benjamin highlights, and he uses the, the French poet Baudelaire uh, as, as his example, is a, a, a poem um, by, by Baudelaire called A une passante, uh, to, a, to a passerby. And one of the experiences of the city that is part of its modernity is that you pass people in the street and you never see those people again. You, you encounter them and each person that you encounter has a past and a future, a life history, circumstances that you will never know anything about, but you glimpse them, you pass. Urban life is, is a sequence of moments of passing by. And that, that modernity, that experience of modernity is different from what you have in uh, the, the rural village where people have lived in the same place for a long time and everybody knows everybody else. Um, the city is a place where you don't know who the other person is that you pass in the street, particularly at night and particularly when they belong to a different social class from you. You would never meet that, that person <laughs> again because you don't inhabit the same cultural world. So modernity is a, a set of encounters with the unknown and with unknown people. And, and Benjamin says that is central to the experience of living in the city and the city is the site of modernity. Um, and this essay is a sequence of such encounters with, with people. Um, but to get back to that, I, I'm sorry, I just, I, I have so much I love about this essay. I, I, I want to say one more thing about the ending of it. You pointed us to that brilliant ending of, of the essay in which he says, um, uh, yes, my houselessness had many miles upon miles of streets in which it could and did have its own solitary way. And one of the key words in this essay is solitary. This, this is an essay that alternates between a feeling of isolation and a desire for, and, and the, the word that is used frequently through the essay is company. The narrator in this story is always looking for company and never finding it. And one example of that, I mean, he looks for company from the people who have a reason, a, a professional reason, a, a work-related reason to be out at night. Policeman, the toll keeper, the guy who serves coffee, um, uh, there, there are various other people whose job it is, the, the turnkeys at the prison. They have a reason to be awake and a place to be at night. But the other people that he meets are people who don't have a job or a reason. They're the, the, the homeless, as we say, the houseless. And the narrator assumes the identity or the persona of a homeless person. But to be homeless is to miss home is to be with, without access to home. And so he alternates, he, the, the, the rhythm of this essay is an intermittent rhythm in which he, he, he goes from isolation and silence to fire and company and a wish to be if not always inside, at least to be in company. So uh, 
the structure of, of the essay is an alternation between inside and outside. Um, it's an essay in which things are the inverse of what they usually are. Uh, 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 anyway, uh, solitude, isolation, loneliness, and the desire for company, the, the, the wish to have home is one of the themes that uh, this essay investigates. So I've gone on for, for too long and, and people are raising hands. So Phyllis, I'll come back to, to you. Please, many people I, have hands up. I, for, I forgot I forgot to um, take my hand down, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go on. So, so yes, Re, uh, Ricardo, have you said what you wanted to say? You had a hand up. Uh, not yet. Uh, John Hyde is the religion. <laughs> Is there religion? religion? Yes, religion. That's still on the table? Yes, it's still <laughs> on the table. Uh, so I, I apologize, full disclosure, I have not yet read the essay. I'm just here because I love to hear you speak. Um, however, William, my better half, uh, did read it and he, he cannot be here, but he sent this note that has a religious reference. And so I thought I'd read it, but I cannot entertain any follow-up questions. Uh, okay. <laughs> so he said, I hope someone will make the point omitted in the footnote on page 14 that Akal Dama, the field of blood where Judas committed suicide and remorse over his betrayal of Jesus, is made into a field for the poor and destitute to be buried in, hence the term potter's field, which refers even today to such a burial plot. Is Dickens, by tagging the old Bailey court, this degenerate Akal Dama, therefore intimating that oh so holy England uses the courts and prisons as a way to bury its poor and destitute just to lock them away. <laughs> so thank you, William, for, for that uh, very lovely observation. And, and yes, I, th I think, uh, you know, one of the ways in which this is a, uh, a socially conscious and socially critical essay is in its awareness of the poor and where the poor end up after they are dead. It's, it's a, an essay that is haunted by, by memories of death. Um, death is everywhere. That murdered corpse that's thrown over the, um, uh, it, you know, the, too, too many to, to point out. Um, but yes, it's a critique of the legal system of the old Bailey that results in this. It's a critique also of the Christian ideology of brotherhood and the way in which brotherhood, um, sympathy, uh, social acceptance in the largest sense is not honored uh, in 19th century Britain for reasons of class, for reasons of poverty, for reasons of law, uh, debt, and, and, and so on. So thank you for that. Yes, Alice. Thanks so much for this great talk and discussion, John. This is just wonderful. So thanks. And um, this is, a, uh, I think, a far more rudimentary interpretation of, of uh, what Richard said. But uh, it seems to me that Dickens is using churches as, and he says here, you know, with the tower of yonder Christian church of St. Sepulchre, monstrously before their eyes. I think that that's really important because we see the church as this towering monstrosity in the, that look, overlooks this houselessness. And it really causes us to think or causes me to think about this mutuality and interdependence that the church as a towering figure has. And then it's lack of sympathy for those who it depends upon seems to suggest the patronizing nature that the church embodies through the you know monstrosity that it creates i was just wondering what you thought about that you 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 said it very well so uh, the, the the essay is about the contradictions between ideology specifically religious ideology and the reality on the ground and i think you said it very well i mean the fact that 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 church, uh, the Church of Saint Sepulchre, is monstrously before their eyes. The, the church is both, you know, the, the place of healing and consolation, and it's also a monster. Um, 
And in that way, it really appeals to the Gothic even more, right? I mean, it really suggests that this, this monster is this other being, right? It, and it also reflects how we are monsters too, through what we create. It's, it, I'll say yes, it's, it's a Gothic story. So I'm gonna go on and, and take other, other hands up. So, so thank you for that, Alice. Mike. Um, there's one other essay I think you could draw into this discussion. You know, George Zimmel, the great German sociologist who was a contemporary of Benjamin, um, he wrote um, the other seminal work on, on the he, it's called The Metropolis and Mental Life, uh, contemporaneously with Benjamin's essay. Um, he's, you know, the essence of city life is anonymity, lack of connection. Uh, but we know from Dickens's other works that he sees underlying the apparent chaos, anonymity, and lack of connection in cities, there's a secret order. Um, you know, that passage from Bleak House that we talked about a few weeks ago, you know, what brings all these, what in the world could connect all these strangers and people unknown to one another? What connects them though is not individual social history, the things you know about people if you grow up in a small town. What connects them are, are mass social things like the spread of cholera, and smallpox. Joe, the, Joe the, the crossing uh, sweeper, remains anonymous to other characters in the book that passes along his, his de deadly disease. And, and again, th this Dickens is strikingly modern in his understanding of the kind of social underpinnings, the mass connections between the strangers who constitute city life, so that we are strangers to one another yet are connected in ways like the transmission of disease, uh, the way the homeless affect the rest of us and so on. Thank you, very well said. So Glenna. Thank you. Um, I wanna riff on the whole idea of houselessness a little. Uh, as we were discussing that, um, you know, frequently recurring word, I it reminded me of, parts of Nicholas Nickleby that I just love. When, um, when uh, Nicholas and Smike are escaping together, there's a point at which uh, Smike says to Nicholas, you are my home. And they're out in the middle of nowhere. So home is not a physical space, it's the space of nurture. And then as I recall, I haven't looked at this recently, but I think when Ralph Nickleby hangs himself. He says something about home or the lack thereof. So I, I bring this up by way of saying that, you know, houselessness is literal and it's also metaphorical. Um, and, um, you know, I, I really, I've thought a lot about the whole issue of Victorian domesticity and the angel in the home and so on. And what I love about Dickens having Smike say to Nicholas, you are my home, it, it's not about gender, it's not about the woman, it's about nurture and love and kindness. And I think that's so liberatory. And um, so, you know, I'm just connecting some of the ways that these themes obviously were in Dickens' uh, mind and imagination. Um, and this powerful use of houselessness in this particular essay. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, and of course, home and domesticity are strikingly absent from this essay. Um, they're, they're there as an absence rather than as a presence. And I, the, the word home, I, I, I brought that to, um, our awareness is mentioned only at the very end of, of the essay. Um, I, I, I said, you know, I hypothesized that uh, the starting point for this is the editorial offices of all the year round, but that's not really a home. It's, it's a, it, Dickens's business office location rather than a domestic home. And the, Dickens is famous or, um, People sometimes say it's a default in his in his writing, 
as the, the great um, celebrator of domesticity and poetry on their side, uh, um, hearth and, and home. Um, but yes, there is that in Dickens, but there's also a more complex understanding of home, which is the one that you suggest between Smike and Nicholas. And then there's also the absence of, of home, the, the, um, the motif of the wanderer, uh, the, the houseless, the homeless, as we say. So thank you, that's a, that's a good observation. Kathleen, Tiger. <laughs> So oh, <clears throat> this is marvelous where you bring this to life. I had no idea it was so rich. And so a thought I have is, well, London is a city of bridges. He has three bridges that he crosses. And I found in my own life that bridges um, represented something, probably a movement, special movement from one to another. And um, so I see that as part of his autobiographical, autobiographical process. Uh, but it's not really, I don't know if it's, it's directly named, but it's there. I'm seeing it on the map more than um, hearing it in the story. So uh, just something to, to uh, look at, perhaps. Well, I, the, the bridges are prominent in the story, and the map makes the bridges even more prominent, because we, we can see the three bridges that feature in the story. And um, I, I see the, the bridges as important structurally in the organization of the essay that the, the river is a kind of threshold. The river is, when, when you pass from um, the London side to the Surrey, Surrey side of, uh, of London, that it's like passing from conscious life into the unconscious. It is passing from um, reasonable, normal life, daily life into something which is unusual. It's, it's passing from day, uh, it's, it's passing from waking life into dream. Um, and that becomes most prominent of all in the passage about the madhouse in, in which the very explicitly the distinction between sanity and insanity uh, is erased. The, 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 bounder, the boundaries of, of waking life vanish into the, the unreality, but equally profound reality of our nighttime existence. And that Dickens is, is fully aware of the way in which subjectivity is, is unstable. And that we have more in common with the mad than, than we think. But there's a certain power in recognizing that. I mean, one of the places that uh, com you know, we, we haven't talked about this, but is, is there comedy? Is, is there humor in, in this essay? And remarkably for me, one of the places where the humor uh, shows through is when he remembers uh, a conversation that he had when he visited the hospital said an afflicted man to me when I was last in a hospital like this, sir, I can frequently fly. I was half ashamed to reflect that so could I by night. So Dickens is, is able to fly. 
and and I I think that's a a, a wonderful metaphor to say that you know I, I I'm just as mad <laughs> and subject to delusions as those who are certified as insane. Um, to be able to fly, what a wonderful thing to be able to fly. Uh, to, to fly is to imagine, to, to, to dream in that powerful imaginative way about the ability to enter into other consciousness, to enter into other states of being. Um, and, and so uh, Dickens is not feeling pity for the for the inhabitants of, of Bedlam, he is identifying with them and identifying with them as having a certain power, a certain capacity to, to dream. Um, uh, you know, said a woman to me on the same occasion, Queen Victoria frequently comes to with me in her magic. To bake a third on horseback in a field marshal's uniform. Could I refrain from reddening with consciousness when I remembered the amazing royal parties I myself had given at night? The unaccountable viands I had put on table and my extraordinary manner of conducting myself on those distinguished occasions. Um, so, so Dickens is saying, me too, me too. It's not, uh, you know, I, I, I don't identify with these forms of being that are considered to be the extreme of otherness. I share in them and they're wonderful. Peaches and macaroni. Uh, <laughs> what, what a wonderful meal. Uh, so Nina, you, you have a hand up. Oh yeah, um, I just wanted to comment on like the last part with like at the coffee house. Um, because I thought it was sort of like a nice transition, I guess, sort of like out of the ghost world with this like very like cadaverous looking guy, but then, you know, kind of like imbibing something very like earthly um, and warm. And I thought just like also having a coffee house kind of lent itself to what you guys were talking about, like with the modernity, because I think that's something that like, you know, a current reader could totally identify with today, <laughs> right? Like the first thing you do, like just go to a coffee shop. Um, but then I also thought it was weird that that was like, you know how he ends which is like he goes and gets a cup of coffee and then and then he's like okay now i can now i've like sufficiently worn myself out i can go to sleep <laughs> um, which is sort of the opposite of what we think yeah. of coffee yeah. i guess like today well I, I i like that ending and the ending for for me has it's it's like waking up from a dream, right? I mean, that's that's one of the things that happens is that you go get your morning cup of coffee, and that's that marks. It's another kind of bridge, you could almost say, but between the night life or the night of nightmare and the waking life. And coffee marks that. And um, th this one of the things that's wonderful about this essay is the way in which it appeals to all the senses. Um, and here I think uh, I, I can, you know, I'm a, I'm a coffee drinker. That, I, I can taste that, that coffee that he finally gets to um, in, in the morning, the coffee and toast. I mean, that's my breakfast. Uh, and so I, I've emerged out of the dream world into a recognizable world of, of food and drink and, and daily life. And, how long has this walk taken? How, what's, what is the duration of this walk? You know, in one sense, we're, we're given that the beginning of the uh, he, he says um, the, the month was March. No, notice the specificity of, of the time and place. The month was March and the weather damp, cloudy and cold the sun not rising before half past five, the night perspective looked sufficiently long at half past 12, which was my time for confirming. So we're given the temporal parameters of this walk. It's gonna, it's gonna last, what is that? Um, six hours, five hours from 12.30, you know, half past midnight to 5.30 in the morning. That's how long it takes. 
but but time is fluid time is permeable time you know it, it takes him back before it's you know we're in 1860 when we start when we buy the copy of all the year round we're back before 1857 we're back in dickens's childhood uh how long is it it's, it's taking the um, you know the, the the five hours of clock time or of we could call it railroad time um but it's also taking a lifetime um, and a, and more than a single lifetime, more than an individual lifetime. Um, it's it's taking in historical time and religious time. And it also there's there's there I asked about religion, and there are two points in the essay that astonish me with respect to religion. And one is, um, the passage where he describes um, it, it's 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 the passage following Westminster Abbey, uh, and I'll I'll just I'll read this. Uh, Westminster Abbey was fine, gloomy society for another quarter of an hour. Notice the specificity of that quarter of an hour, you know, 15 minutes here, here in this location, but it's much more than 15 minutes if you think about imaginative time, suggesting a wonderful procession of its dead among the dark arches and pillars, each century more amazed by the century following it than by all the centuries going before. And one of the things anyone who's ever been to Westminster Abbey knows is that uh, it, it contains many graves. Um, the, the, the Abbey itself is a burial site. So um, this, this is a place where a quarter of an hour takes across centuries of the dead who are buried there. And indeed, in those houseless night walks, which even included cemeteries where watchmen went round among the graves at stated times and moved the telltale handle of an index which recorded that they had touched it at such an hour. It was a solemn consideration what enormous hosts of dead belonged to one old great city and how if they were raised while the living slept, there would not be the space of a pin's point in all the streets and ways for the living to come out into. Not only that, but the vast armies of dead would overflow the hills and valleys beyond the city and would stretch away all around it. God knows how far. This is, this is an extraordinary moment of imagination as far as I'm concerned, because he's imagining the resurrection of the dead. He's imagining all of the dead who were buried, not just in Westminster Abbey, but in all the cemeteries of London, suddenly coming to life. And the, the vision of the, the condition of crowdedness, which is one of the features of modernity and of urban life, with all its anonymity and the alienation that comes from not knowing the name of the person you pass in the street. Suddenly, if all the dead in London came to life, there wouldn't be enough room for people, for the living. Um, and it's, it's a kind of horrific, literal version of the resurrection of the dead. And uh, it's not just the streets of London that would be crowded, it would be the countryside as, as well. So th 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 this is a vision of a certain kind of mass culture, the sort of thing that Mike was talking about, that the, the social forms uh, force us to be part of a unified system, not just anonymous, isolated beings. So that's one strange moment of a religious vision for, for me in this essay. And then the other, and this is, this is, is in some ways the, um, the most powerful moment in, in the whole essay is the encounter with the young man in uh, near St. Uh, Martin's Church. Suddenly, 
a thing that in a moment more I should have trodden upon without seeing, rose up at my feet with pride, loneliness, and helplessness, struck out of it by the bell, the like of which I never heard. We then stood face to face, looking at one another, frightened by one another. The creature was like a beetle-browed, hair-lipped youth of 20, and it had a loose bundle of rags on, which it held together with one of its hands. It shivered from head to foot, and its teeth chattered, and as it started, as it stared at me, persecutor, devil, ghost, whatever it thought me, it made me with it, it made with its whining mouth as if it were snapping at me like a worried dog. Intending to give this ugly object money, I put out my hand to stay it, for it recoiled as it whined and snapped and laid my hand upon its shoulder. Instantly, it twisted out of its garment like the young man in the New Testament and left me standing alone with its rags in my hands. I mean, that's, that's the quintessential moment of encounter with the absolute other. And the other that is both, both self, the homeless, the houseless version in its extreme condition and the absolute other with whom there is no relation, that it, the object, the thing, as the narrator calls it. So the narrator is experiencing both the impulse to sympathize and to offer charity, to give money, which is its way of um, absolving its feelings of guilt, and trying to offer a gesture of, um, of sympathy and connection. And, and yet it doesn't work. It, it, the connection is not made. And he's left, he, he reaches out. It's a moment of touch. I mean, all of the other sensations, smell and, and even taste with the, the coffee and, and the peaches and macaroni, um, and, and certainly sight, but touch is, is largely absent from, from the essay. And this is a moment where the narrator reaches out to touch this young man, and then the young man vanishes, and the connection is lost. And it's, it's a moment of uses the specifically religious reference to the young man in the New Testament. And the narrator is left holding the rags, the, the ghost, the absent other. Um, we can't, it's a nightmare, but it's a living social nightmare as well. Um, Then the strangest part of the whole essay for me is the encounter with the man who eats his pudding from his hat. And I wonder if people have any thoughts about that. <laughs> he, he describes that man as um, uh, the most spectral person my houselessness encountered. And it's one of the very few times where there's any conversation that takes place in the essay. And I said before that I think that, that one theme in, in the essay is the wish for company, for community, to escape from isolation and to connect with the other person. And, and yet when he, he meets other people, there's no exchange of conversation. There's no, this is a silent, journey but at the coffee house he meets this red-faced man and the red-faced man 
at least has conversation with the barista, <laughs> if we can use that anachronistic term. Am I red tonight? You are, the barista uncompromisingly answered. My mother, said the specter, was a red-faced woman that liked to drink. And I looked at her hard when she laid in her coffin and I took the complexion. And then the narrator says, somehow the pudding seemed an unwholesome pudding after that. And I put myself in its way no more. Uh, and another thing that uh, strikes me about that moment in the, in the essay is that that's the only woman in the, in the whole story. This is a, a male world. Well, you know, he, he says at the end that if he had looked for vice and misfortune, he could have gone there, he could have found it. So there are street walkers, but they're not in this story. Um, but that woman, a mother, a maternal presence, maybe a home, but not figured is, well, I'm, I, I don't know quite how to understand her. It's, it's a, a mother who's seen in her, um, uh, in her coffin, who has a red face, and a man has a red face. And it's not a conversation where there is mutuality or exchange or understanding. And the man who eats is putting out of his hat. I, I don't know what to make out of, out of that either. It's one, one person I know said, it, it's as if he takes off his hat and his brain comes with it and he eats his brain. This is a brain pudding. Um, and that seems to me a little wild, but, but maybe, maybe something like that is going on. So I don't know. I mean, do, do people have any thoughts about, about the man who eats his pudding out of his hat? So Bill. Um, the way you described that particular piece of the essay uh, made it sound like the conversation was going on between the narrator and the man who eats pudding. And, and I went back and looked at it. And I got to say that when I first read it, I thought it was a conversation the narrator overheard because there's a reference to the man of sleep as the other partner of that conversation. And if that is in fact, um, Dickens or the narrator, uh, he was a, a man of sleeplessness <laughs> as well as houselessness. But at that moment, he's become the man of sleep who is asleep to this person's uh, oddity, uh, this person's perhaps lack of um, manners, uh, this, this person's uh, lack of home, and yet that's- Yeah, you're, you're of sort of breaking up, so I'm not- Yeah, okay, I'll sign off. Okay, um, that's, that's a really interesting suggestion. I, I, I read it the way that I described as a conversation that takes place between the man who serves the coffee and the red-faced man. Um, and I understand the man of sleep as a reference back earlier to the, um, uh, in the, uh, earlier in the same paragraph, um, toast of a very substantial quality was likewise procurable, though the tousle-headed man who made it, this is, I'm calling him the barista, uh, in an inner chamber, within the coffee room hadn't got his coat on yet and was so heavy with sleep that in every interval of toast and coffee, he went off anew behind the partition into complicated crossroads of choke and snore 
and lost his way directly. So I'm reading the, the man of sleep as a reference to that server, the man who makes the toast and, and coffee, and who seems to recognize the red-faced man because the red-faced man has come here before. And when he arrives, the, the man who makes the, co the toast and coffee um, actually brings him a, um, a, a cup of tea, doesn't he? Um, yeah, the, the, the man of sleep, yes. This mysterious man was known by his pudding. So he's a regular customer at, the, at this particular establishment. Um, for on his entering, the man of sleep brought him a pint of hot tea, a small loaf, and a large knife and fork and plate. Left to himself in his box, he stood the pudding on the bare table, and instead of cutting it, stabbed it overhand with the knife like a mortal enemy. Then took the knife out, wiped it on his sleeve, tore the pudding sunder with his fingers, and ate it all up. Um, anyway, that, that's how, how I, I think of the conversation as, as taking place between the, the barista guy and, and the, the red-faced man. But your suggestion is not entirely off. I mean, th this could be also the narrator's identification with the, the man of, of, of sleep or of sleeplessness. Um, and um, since this is really the, the only, I, if you go back and look through the essay and look for dialogue, there is no dialogue. There's, there's no exchange of speech in the action of the story. The, the closest to it is when the narrator at, at Waterloo Bridge approaches the toll keeper because he wants to be able to say good night to someone. And I, I think good night is the only time where, there's, where the narrator actually says something to another person. There, you remember there's another place early in the essay where he, he sees somebody whose head is poking out of the doorway and they look at each other and they stare at each other, um, but they say nothing to each other. Uh, and so silence is another form of loneliness or isolation. Um, and then when you finally get a conversation, it's this very weird conversation with the man who eats his brain out of his hat and, and stabs it and remembers his red-faced mother and identifies with, with his alcoholic mother. I, I mean, it, it is, it, this is so... I mean, the task figure of, of nightmare. Um, and in, in one sense, it's, it's, it's part of the conclusion to the, to the essay. So we're almost out of time, uh, folks. Uh, but I hope you like this essay. <laughs> um, and if I had thought more about it, I would have, would have asked you to read some other short pieces that deal with nighttime journeys. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a genre. And the Georgia Augustus Sawa piece that was mentioned early on is uh, is a good example. So, uh, Glenna, and then Trudy, and then we'll we'll have to go. I love the essay, and I thought that it, for me it was like not only a physical journey or journey through time, but it was a journey to um, places that would have inspired a novel. Um, you know, you can see some of the themes of Bleak House emerging, or when he goes to the Houses of Parliament, you think about the scenes in uh, Barnaby Rudge and so on. So it's like, um, it's like a whole uh, panoply of Dickens' works have some kind of um, reference, and it was really a wonderful thing to read. Um, one comment on that, 
because uh, I, I think of Bleak House when I read this too. And it's partly, and there, there's a, there's a it, you remember it's March and it's a rainy night. And, and the narrator says, drip, drip, drip. That, that's the refrain from Bleak House, right? That's Chesney Wolf. So I, I, I think there are even verbal echoes of other Dickens texts. So Trudy, you get the last word. Unmute. Uh, I didn't find the putting in the hat at, un, at all unusual. I've read of other instances of that sort of thing, of people keeping their food in their hat uh, as a um, safe place for it. Uh, but uh, the red face did, of course, suggest the alcoholism and the routine um, uh, and the uh, total lack of pleasure in the food, stabbing it, you know, uh, maybe connects this man to the to the concept of dry rot, dry rot in the beginning. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about dry rot. Yeah, and I and I think you know this man is maybe an example of of dry rot. His, uh, you know, uh, anyway. Uh, the big question I had, and there's not time yet, but I know this is used with the high school students, right, as a um, takeoff point for their writing an essay. Uh, do you know what the prompt is for those students when they read this? We ha we have several prompts. Um, one of one of them is to ask them to uh, say what they have learned about the narrator. Who is the narrator? If you don't think of him just biographically as Dickens, is he married? What class does he belong to? Uh, what occupation does he have? What, what clues are there in the essay as to who the narrator is? Another one is about their own experience of walking through the street and uh, of a city and, and meeting other people. And then another prompt has to do with the pandemic and how time is represented in the essay and how time is experienced during the pandemic. So those are the, uh, the directions of the, the prompt. Yeah. So anyway, we, we need to stop. It's uh, 3.01 my time. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you. Fun. And uh, Tale of Two Cities uh, next month. And Wayne will be in touch about the reading. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, John.